could open your Bibles to uh, Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark. We'll spend yeah, probably most of our time in the Gospel of Mark today. Uh, we've been working our way through some things, thinking about uh, things that Jesus taught that were difficult, things that Jesus uh, said that I think we need to wrestle with individually and as a church. Um, and so I've been presenting those for the last month, and I've got a whole bunch more. We're not done yet. Uh, today we'll take another look at what Jesus is, uh, is trying to teach us uh, about amazement, uh, and we're going to talk uh, about that a bit more today. Uh, have you ever seen or done something that you thought was amazing? Have you ever done that? Uh, now, some of you have, you know, tripped, and other people thought it was amazing, uh, and, you know, like how you landed the, uh, the the landing on your fall. Uh, a few years ago, my, my I was in a band. This is, okay, a lot of years ago, but uh, we opened for a national act, and I got out on the stage. We were the opening act, and uh, I was playing a lead guitar part, and I was really getting into it, and I thought the crowd was loving me. Like, I thought I was amazing, uh, and their reaction was pretty, pretty obvious that they really, really were digging me. Uh, until I was done with the solo and I turned around and the lead guitar player for the other band was actually playing air guitar behind me. It had nothing to do with me. They were cheering for someone in the background. I thought I was amazing. I was not. Um, and that happens to me more than I'd like to admit, I suppose, that uh, sometimes I think I'm amazing, but I'm not. Sometimes I tell jokes that I think are amazing, and they're not. And uh, uh, I see that often. Do you like to be amazed, though? Do you like to be amazed? Uh, I think we do. Like as a culture, we like to do things that are amazing. We went to the Grand Canyon this last week, and that was, that was amazing. Like you know, we I've been there once before, but uh, Jan and Jacob and I we took a little trip, and uh, well, that wasn't really a little trip. We drove. It was a long trip, uh, but it was a great view, and it was an amazing view. And we were truly uh, blessed to be able to see this incredible feature of this creation. Uh, we like to be amazed. Uh, recently, I, I was um, uh, well. I, I say I was invited to go, but I was I was. Well, Jen made me go uh, to a holiday party at her office. She works for the University of uh, Colorado, and they do this big annual holiday party. And uh, one of the things they did this year was they had some entertainment there. They had a magician. Uh, and the magician was just this woman that was going around to different tables and people and doing little magic tricks. And uh, um, I would say, you know, she was actually pretty good. I mean, she wasn't really good. I mean, after all, she was doing, you know, uh, college holiday parties, right? I think if you're really good at this kind of thing that you do that at a larger level, like there's another level of goodness after this, but she was pretty good. And we had uh, actually Rick and Annette Kramer. A lot of you guys know Rick and Annette Kramer. They were there also, and that works as well for the same, uh, uh, same building that Jan's in, but she works from a distance, obviously from Indiana. And uh, they were there, but this lady comes up to our group and she says, I want to do a magic trick for you there. And she has this book and she picks Rick. Apparently he looks like the most susceptible one in the crowd. I try to look like, like, I like don't mess with me. I don't want any part to do with this because I don't. And uh, so she takes this book in her hand and she goes, okay, and she puts it, this is important, left hand, right hand. And she puts it in front of him and says, I'm going to open this. I want you to pick a picture, any picture that you want. You just open it up, pick the picture, memorize it real quickly and then close it. And so she, she lets her hand off. He opens it picks it closes it and uh and then um uh, she starts a conversation with us about how she can read minds and someone taught her how to do that and so she goes back around and she says so i'm going to tell you that what you saw was a star and he goes wow that's amazing how did you know that well i from the side had seen how she knows that because i was watching because instead of left hand right hand she went right hand left hand and on one side of the pages was a variety of symbols on the other was all the same symbol like you could not get anything other than a star were we amazed everyone but me because i saw what was happening uh but but they were absolutely amazed also she did a card trick there and i was sitting there watching and i was sitting down and i saw that she had the card that the person picked on the bottom and she flipped it up from the bottom like it was from the top i caught her that's why she's not a professional <laughs> anyway we like to be amazed though i mean i like to watch things that are amazing and and i think that that's kind of just kind of normal for us i mean there, but, but isn't there good amazing and then bad amazing isn't there two different kinds of amazing when you think about this, I mean, there are some things that you go, like, you know, I was amazed that that happened. Um, we were uh, driving down I-40 from Albuquerque, and we saw uh, a, a big accident. A semi-truck had hit a state police uh, vehicle and driven them off the median, down a, or off the side of the road, down into a ditch. Uh, that's That was amazing, right? You know, But that anyone would live through that, that was amazing. You know, So we, we say a bad amazing, we have good amazing. I suppose that if you found out that you were having a baby, 
That would be amazing, right? But only if you were expecting to have a baby. Like if you weren't really expecting it, that's like bad amazing, right? So it just kind of depends on, on, on the context of that. And I, I say all this to kind of get you to understand that sometimes there are terms that we read in the Bible that have a variety of meanings. Uh, and so when you read something like amazing, it doesn't always necessarily mean the same thing. Uh, so you have to kind of be careful. And we do that in our culture as well. If I said that something is cool, right, what would you think? Oh, that's cool. You know, like, like it's okay. It's all right. I like that, you know. Uh, or if I said, well, it's cool in here, which it was during class, uh, you'd understand I'm talking about temperature, but I'm using the same word, but it has a different meaning in different contexts. Uh, for example, if you were to say whatever, uh, can whatever be a word that you use in a number of ways that mean a number of different things? Uh, like, for example, if you're like, hey, where do you want to go for dinner? Oh, I don't care, whatever. Um, they do care. It does matter. Do, do not mistake that whatever does not mean, it doesn't mean what you think it does. Or if your spouse or significant other says to you, say, fine, whatever, just do whatever you want. That does not mean do whatever you want. It means the opposite of that. You have to understand. But there are times when you say things like, well, you know, whatever's fine. You really mean whatever is fine, right? So we use words in different ways, and we have to be very careful to understand what they mean. And, and the same thing of that is really true in the Bible. Uh, and so you have to be careful because sometimes amazed uh, might mean that you're astonished by something. The, the word could be translated astonished. Like, like when Jesus did something, you might say, well, that was astonishing, you know, that really captured someone's attention. Um, but sometimes the word amazed uh, means that you're very distressed about something. Like you're very deeply concerned about something. You could, could have that feeling. Um, you might also have uh, uh, the word uh, amazed could also be surprised. Have you ever been surprised by something? Uh, speaking of Rick Kramer, he and I, one time, he was an elder at, at Northwest at the time uh, with me, and, and we went to see Rush in concert. And we had a little surprise. Uh, as soon as the band came on, there was a woman with two very large drinks that stood up and went, yay. And we were surprised because we wore those drinks for the rest of the time that we were there. And our wives were surprised when we got home because we didn't smell quite like we should have. Um, what have you boys been doing? I'm like, oh, I'm a preacher. He's an elder. We're fine. And that didn't seem to work. Uh, but I was surprised by that. Uh, so surprises happen all the time. But that's, again, that same word amazed. Or you could have wonder about something. Like, like when we looked at the Grand Canyon, you would have this sense of wonder. Like, wow. It's amazing, right? You feel that sense of wonder. Um, or or might, you might even have like this idea that you marvel at something. Like when we first moved to Colorado, um, we would look at the mountains and we would think, wow, that's marvelous. Do you feel that same way? Like it, we, you could be very desensitized to something that's as marvelous as mountains, but we are still marveling at, at mountains. Um, I was thinking of this when I saw Ethan this morning that, uh, yeah, Ethan White right there, yeah. So remember Marvel Comics? Uh, well, you know, there's these marvelous, astonishing things, and you have uh, you have Spider-Man, and I just saw a clip from a Spider-Man uh, Marvel uh, television series from 1977. I was seven, and I thought it was marvelous. Okay, but by today's standards, it was not. It was actually really pitiful and poorly, poorly, poorly done. Um, all right. So anyway, all kidding aside, you know, we have these ideas of what what amazing is or what marvelous is. Sometimes the word means in the Bible that someone has has marveled at something uh, or that they were amazed and it means that they lost their senses about it, like they lost their mind. Um, have you ever seen something that was so amazing that you just, you just couldn't hardly believe your eyes? Like you almost even have like you were beside yourself. You ever have that feeling that it's almost like an out-of-body experience or an out-of-mind experience because something was so amazing. So uh, these are all words that have to do with, uh, with amazing, things that, that we react to when something incredible happens, okay? Um, and so this shows up in the life of Jesus. And we could talk about this in terms of, of God and the amazing things that God has done. It wouldn't be very hard for us to sit here and just kind of pick story after story after story of amazing things that God has done. Or to look through the Bible, particularly in Acts, and say, look at the amazing work of the Holy Spirit. We can look at all those things. But I want to focus on Jesus for just a few moments, on some things that amazed people about Jesus. And again, just like those mountains, sometimes I think that we could read these things about Jesus and it can become very familiar. It could be something that doesn't amaze us anymore, doesn't capture our attention. The incredible nature of what's God, what Jesus says and what he does can sometimes escape us because we just kind of uh, kind of let it become familiar and routine. And I don't think we should ever do that. Um, so we're reminiscing a bit about Jesus. We can think of some pretty important things that he did that were amazing. Can you think of some, some amazing things that, that Jesus did? Uh, for example, I'll just give you kind of like a couple of them before we get into the text. Uh, what about creation? 
Did you know that Jesus is God's agent of creation? That all of the stuff that you see was not just in the mind of God, but was the action of Christ that actually brings about the creation. In Hebrews chapter uh, uh, it's chapter 1, the first four verses, he's referred to as the agent of creation. Like Jesus is the creator. Um, that's pretty impressive. That's amazing, isn't it? I would say that's amazing. Um, what about Jesus becoming flesh and living with us? We talked about that as the incarnation. Right. Uh, so Jesus, who was God, who was infinite in every place at every time or beyond place and beyond time, enters into a place at a time and becomes flesh. And not only does he create everything, but he also becomes part of his own creation. Uh, and he does it in an amazing way. He becomes uh, a, a part of that creation through a virgin birth into a poor family in uncertain circumstances. And through that, he brings about a life that was an amazing life. Wouldn't you agree? Amazing life. Um, at the end of his life, he does something that's very amazing. In fact, I think most of us wouldn't even be here this morning uh, talking about any of this if it weren't for Jesus who died for our sins. He becomes not only the creator, but also the one who is a part of his creation. And then he offers himself as a sacrifice so that we can have salvation, so that we could have a place with God that we gave up because of our sins. That's pretty amazing that God would allow that or that God would, would plan that, but that Jesus would enter into humanity and offer himself as a sacrifice. What an incredible gift that is. You know, the Bible never says that Jesus rose for our sins, right? What does it say? It says he died for our sins. But the good news is, he also arose from the grave, and that's another amazing thing, right? When we think about Jesus and amazement, are you not amazed that he is alive from the dead? Like, I mean, if you think about some of the things that we believe, uh, some pretty amazing stuff. Jesus is born of a virgin. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus offers his life for us. Jesus is raised from the dead to a new life that can never be taken away. That's an amazing thing. We believe some amazing things, and sometimes um, you know, my mind hasn't quite caught up with what I believe. I believe it, but it's sometimes struggling. Like, do, I, do I really believe that? That is so incredible and amazing. Uh, but if you've been around this a long time, you might begin to start thinking, well, maybe this isn't so amazing. Maybe you don't feel quite the same way as, as you used to about these things. Jesus not only did all of these things, but he also uh, left earth and ascended back to the right hand of the Father. Isn't that amazing? And he's preparing a place for us. That's a wonderful thing. Can you even imagine what that's going to be like? And then one more thing about Jesus uh, before I get into the details here. Um, Jesus is coming back again. Uh, now, now, listen, it hasn't happened yet. So how amazed are you about the second coming of Jesus? Uh, well, if you're not amazed by that possibility, and if you're not ready for it, you're going to be really amazed, but not in the good way. You're going to be really, really shocked because Jesus said he's going to come back. And when he returns, he brings all of this that he has done and that he's created and that he has offered redemption uh, through, and he's going to bring it all to its appropriate ending. And that will be the beginning of something new. And that's going to be amazing for those of us who belong to God through Christ. Um, that's a pretty amazing list of things, isn't it? I'd say that's a pretty amazing list of things. So when you go back into the Bible, you start reading through places like the Gospel of Mark, you start seeing some things uh, about Jesus in, in particular. So read with me just a little bit. This is going to be in chapter 1, um, and we're going to read in verse 21. But Jesus is gathering disciples at this point. It says, They went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. Uh, they were amazed at his teaching. What were they? They were amazed at his teaching. Well, why? What was different about his teaching? They had gone to synagogue for their whole life. Some of them, that's all they'd ever done uh, on the Sabbath. They went to synagogue and had they heard teaching before. They had heard all kinds of teaching. Uh, but this time is different. They were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority, not as the scribes. I mean, as people listened to Jesus, it wasn't just that they heard his teaching. They're like, it's like this is his idea. It's like it's like he's not teaching something that he heard from someone else. Like he's the origination point of all of this teaching here. He's teaching as one that has authority. And could Jesus be the authority on all the teaching? Absolutely. He was the only authority on the teaching. Uh, but it goes on. They were amazed by this. And then come, comes along this guy in verse 23 that uh, had uh, in their midst there an unclean spirit. He cried out saying, what business do you have with, uh, with, with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This is interesting. The demons actually know who he is already. Like there's, there's no introductions that need to be made here. Everybody else is just getting to know Jesus, but they know who he is. 
And it says, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him, throwing him into convulsions. Um, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came to him, or uh, came out of him. They were all, what's the word in your Bible? They were all amazed. They're amazed twice in this. Not just that Jesus is teaching, but that he's teaching as one with authority. Um, not just that there was an unclean spirit inside of this man. They'd seen this on other occasions. This was not new or different for them. This was not that amazing. Did you notice it didn't say they were amazed that an unclean spirit was in this man? But what was amazing was that Jesus had the authority in his teaching uh, to teach and the authority to cast out this demon. Like this is a powerful and amazing moment that, that, we, that we read about. Go to the next chapter, chapter two. And uh, what's happening here, again, is you're not dealing with Jesus having just authority to teach or authority over the demons, but authority over even physical infirmity. And you have this guy who was uh, born, he was paralyzed, he was never able to walk, and Jesus encounters him. And the first thing he does is pretty amazing. The guy comes to him to be healed in his legs, right? But what does Jesus do first? He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Does he have authority here to do that? He absolutely does. He's the son of God. That's amazing that he was going to offer the forgiveness of sins. Um, but even uh, in addition to that, he doesn't just offer forgiveness of sins. He also says to him, your sins are forgiven. Now take your mat and get up and walk. And the guy does it. He gets up and he walks. And everyone is full of amazement. In fact, it says as much. Um, it says in verse uh, 12, he says, and he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that all were uh, they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Isn't that the nature of amazement? Like, like I think if you see something over and over and over again, it doesn't remain amazing anymore, right? At some point, you just kind of get used to it. Uh, you know, Jan used to get up in the morning and see me and think, oh, he's amazing. Uh, now, she doesn't even notice that I exist, I think, some mornings, which is probably for the best. Um, I still think she's amazing, but whatever. But the point is that if something happens over and over and over again, it starts to lose its amazement. Uh, here they're seeing something that Jesus is doing. He has this authority to teach. He has this authority over demons. He has this authority over physical infirmities and the authority to forgive sins. This is amazing. Jesus isn't like the other prophets. He isn't like the other teachers. He is absolutely, uh, beyond a doubt, uh, amazing. Uh, a couple chapters later, in chapter 5, we have another situation here where Jesus has already done some amazing things. He's walked on water, for example. That's pretty amazing. Uh, in chapter 5, there's this demon again that has uh, been causing this guy all kinds of problems. He's been just uh, just running uh, roughshod over this guy's life and over the lives of everyone around him, right? And so he's just destroying everything around him. And this is a, a difficult one to cast out to some degree. But Jesus comes along and in chapter 5 and uh, about verse 20. Um, you know, it says, uh, it, well, I started a little bit earlier, this demon-possessed guy comes along, verse 19, he says, he didn't let him in, but he said to him, go home to your people. He's already cast him out. Um, it, it, the demon just, just cast him out. And so this guy is now wondering, where do I go from here? He says, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed, right? You know, we see this amazement thing coming up, and it just, just does this over and over again. Uh, I'm not going to exhaust all of this in Mark. I just want you to see a, a bit of this. Go to chapter 10 with me. Um, in chapter 10, uh, we have Jesus who was dealing with this rich young ruler. And sometimes the things that Jesus says are, are amazing, uh, not not because uh, they're, they're great things, but because they're difficult things, right? And so Jesus says some very difficult things. And to this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what more do I have to do to inherit eternal life, right? And so Jesus says to him, well, you need to take everything that you have. And he's a very rich young man. And you take all of that stuff and, and sell it and give it to the poor and then come and follow after me. Um, and the young man leaves. It says he went away grieving. Uh, in verse 22, for he was one who owned much property. Now, what happens next, I think, is important. He says in verse 23, Jesus, uh, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. What just happened? Well, there was a wealthy guy that just was sad and grieved because he didn't want to give up what he had in order to receive what he was asking for, right? He was not willing to count the cost. So verse 24 says, the disciples were amazed at his words. So Jesus said, "What? Wow, rich? It's hard for rich people to uh, to enter the kingdom of God." They're amazed. But Jesus answered again and said to them, "Children, how hard it is 
to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Wouldn't that be amazing if a camel went through the eye of a needle? That would be an amazing thing. And he's saying that there's something even more amazing about a rich man entering the kingdom of God, much less any person entering the kingdom of God. He says they were much more, they were even more astonished. Again, that same word amazed is a translator here, astonished, and said to him, then who can be saved? And looking at uh, them, Jesus said, with people, this is impossible, but with God, what happens? All, all things are possible. This isn't possible with you. What's amazing, though, is that with God, all things are possible. And, and that's a beautiful, beautiful message for those of us who are rich in this world or those of us who think that we can't ever add up. We can never add up. Only God does that for us. We have an inheritance through the kingdom of God because of what Jesus does, and that is absolutely ama amazing, and God can do all of these things. Um, so uh, chapter 12, I'm going to give you just a couple more of these here, and then I'll, I'll start bringing this to a conclusion. But chapter 12, um, Jesus is uh, going back and forth with some of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and such, uh, and uh, Jesus uh, says something to them, and this seems kind of simple, I think, on the, on the uh, uh, surface, but they're trying to trick him. They're saying, hey, should we pay our taxes, right? You know, April's coming, everybody. Should you pay your taxes? Don't, don't answer that publicly. You should pay your taxes. That's what Jesus is going to say. But what he says is, he says, what you should do with this coin, they present. So should we give this money as a pay our taxes there? And Jesus says, you know what he says, right? He says, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. And the inscription, he wants them to see that, that Caesar's on that coin. He says, you give this to Caesar. It belongs to Caesar but you belong to God. What's the inscription on your life? Does your whole life belong to God? Um, and so when he teaches this, it says in verse 17, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. What's their reaction? It says, and they were amazed at him, that he had answered this question. Um, Jesus didn't care about the material possessions of this world or the money that belongs to Caesar or the money that you think belongs to you. What he's concerned about is that the marking on you indicates that you belong to God your whole life and all of your entire uh, entirety. Um, now, the most amazing thing, and we mentioned this already, it's on Jesus' resume of amazing things, is in chapter 16. Um, and of course, at the end of all the Gospels, we have a, an account that looks something like this. Uh, that Jesus at this point has done the most amazing thing, right? Uh, he has gone and he has offered himself as a sacrifice. He's died on the cross. He's been buried in a grave. And now he has been raised back to new life. And in chapter 16, uh, they come along and they're looking for Jesus. And it says in ch chapter 16, verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, uh, bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb for us? Looking up, they saw that the stone had, amazing, right? Had already been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Like, who's got the strength to do this? Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. Like, this is a shocking moment for the disciples. Um, and he said to them, do not be amazed. How is that even possible, right? Like you just got up and went to go and take care of the body of Jesus and you get there and it's all the stone's already rolled away. And there's some dude sitting in there in white clothing and you don't know what's going on here and Jesus isn't there. That's amazing. And he says, don't be amazed. Well, why? Why not be amazed? He said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. Here's the amazing part. If you think it's amazing that he's not here, where do you hear why he's not here? And he's not here because he has risen. He is not here. Behold, here's the place where they laid him. But go and tell the disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And when they, uh, they went out and fled the tomb for... Uh, Trembling and astonishment had, a gr had gripped them. Okay, that's that same word again that could be translated as amazed. They were astonished. They were, um, they were trembling and they were astonished with what they had just seen. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. This is amazing. Like when we read our Bible, sometimes I think we just kind of cruise by these things that we've seen thousands of times. And, and it's, it's not okay to do that because what we just saw was Jesus who is for sure the Son of God, who is for certain the one that God has approved of as the sacrifice that will take away the sin of the world. This is the moment of astonishment and of amazement. 
Um, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 12, it says that they were marveling at this. Uh, chapter 24 and verse 12. Um, the story that follows in Luke in chapter 24, if you'll read that with me just real quickly, I'll go there. But well, there's the story at the end of Luke that's kind of interesting to me. And here they are. Jesus has uh, died. Jesus has been buried. Jesus is alive from the grave. The disciples have seen this. They are astonished. They are marveling. They are amazed at what is happening. And as this other group uh, of people, a couple of them are traveling down this road, going to a place called Emmaus. Uh, and I'm sure that you've probably heard of the road to Emmaus. Well, they're on the road to Emmaus. And uh, you're going to look about verse 22 is where I want you to kind of see this. But as they're going along, Jesus unannounced to them, like un unknown to them. They can't see him. They can't recognize him. I mean, they know he's there, but they don't recognize him for who he is. And he's traveling with them and he's going, well, hey, what's going on? Where are you going? And they say, well, we're going to a man's house. And he goes, well, this, what's been happening? Why, why, why is everybody looking so sad here? Uh, and they say, well, haven't you heard, right? <laughs> like, where have you been? G you know, they don't know who he is, but where have you been, right? Uh, and they start explaining, don't you know the things that just took place that Jesus uh, who was to be the Messiah, was taken and he was crucified. And now they don't know where his body is. They don't know where he's gone. They don't know what's going on. It's amazing what's happened. And it says in verse 22, it says, um, but also some women uh, among us amazed us. Uh, well, what was the amazing news? They can't find Jesus. Uh, when they were at the tomb early in the morning, they did not find his body and came. Uh, they came saying that uh, they'd also seen a vision of angels who had uh, who, who said that he was alive. That's amazing news, that Jesus is alive from the dead. Um, and so they carry on their way. And as they go a little bit further down the way, they stop and they're going to stay for the night. And Jesus is going to stay with them. They don't know it's him yet. And they have a meal together. And, uh, and, and they, this, this is what it says, just a little bit later. Uh, it says um, in verse 25, he says, And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And this is an interesting thing to me. Uh, because while it is truly amazing that Jesus died and was buried and was raised from the dead and that he's now alive, as that news is spreading out among people, what is even more amazing, to Jesus is that they didn't see what was happening. Like they should have known that this was the case. They should have seen this. Have you been so slow that you haven't figured out that this was what God had planned all along? For the disciples that were with Jesus when he was taken away, they were shocked and they ran. But Jesus had warned them in advance that that's exactly what was going to happen, that he was going to fulfill the scriptures. Um, Jesus is surprised at how foolish they are and how slow of heart they are to believe the things that have already been spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with the prophets, he explained uh, to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And as they came to the conclusion of that, they recognized Jesus for who he is finally, and they are amazed to see Jesus. And then they move along and Jesus disappears mm -hmm. off um, in another way. Um, when God does what he says he will do, we should not be amazed. Wouldn't you agree? When God says that he's going to do something and then he does it, we should no longer be amazed. The reason for that is the same reason why when over and over and over something happens, it no longer carries with it amazement. Uh, God has always kept his word. He's always made promises and fulfilled them. It shouldn't be amazing. Like we're astonished. I can't believe that happened. When God carries out his will and does what he says he's going to do, we should trust him that much. Um, is it still amazing? I think it is. But should we be astonished? Should we be marveling at it? I can't believe God finally kept his word. That's not how it works. He always keeps his word. Um, it's interesting in Revelation, uh, I, I was reading this earlier this week and it occurred to me uh, in Revelation chapter 13, I won't, uh, I won't read that for you, but in Revelation 13, you have this interesting thing that happens. Um, actually, if you read in verse three, you'll see that word amazement comes up again. Uh, but the beast in Revelation is Rome. Uh, and this beast has taken on an injury that was a nearly fatal injury and recovers from it. Uh, and the whole world, it says, is amazed by its recovery and they begin to follow the beast. Well, isn't that interesting that when uh, Rome is damaged, when the beast is hurt and uh, people see its recovery, that they go, wow, we'll follow after the world, we'll follow after the beast. And yet when Christ, the Son of God, dies on a cross and is resurrected from the grave, he should be the one that the whole world follows. But instead, we tend to follow the world instead of following after Jesus. 
I think people see uh, amazing things in the world and they follow the world rather than the creator of the world. They worship the thing that's been created and follow after it and give it glory rather than the one who actually created uh, the world that we live in. Um, what has God done in your life that was amazing? Uh, maybe the, as you contemplate things today and maybe tomorrow, uh, you know, we, we start thinking about the next year about right now, I suppose. We're thinking about New Year's resolutions and things like that. Uh, this last week, I was thinking ahead a little bit and I bought a, uh, I bought a scale. <laughs> uh, what a discouraging thing that is. And, and, and not only are they scales, it's bad enough that you have to step on them and then they tell you lies that you don't want to believe. Uh, but this one actually... It actually uh, kind of like it, it gets on my phone and it tells me things. It's like, oh, you're, you're gaining weight, you're losing weight. It's telling me all this stuff that I want to, but I'm not asking. It's like popping up like little pop-ups on my phone saying, you need, like I'm looking at desserts and it's going, don't do it. You know, like, I don't know how it even knows. Um, uh, but as we're thinking about the year ahead, I want to think about the year in the past. What has God done in your life that is amazing? Um, do you see that the salvation that you have received through Christ is the most amazing thing that's ever happened in your life? Uh, and you can begin to take that for granted, but you shouldn't because it is still the most amazing thing that God loves you and that he redeems you through his son, Jesus. Um, what is God doing in your life right now that is amazing? I think sometimes we go through life and we don't, we don't discern what's happening around us. I think sometimes we just let life kind of happen and things are going on. And sometimes we start to feel a little bit distant from God. And, and maybe God's not really around us all that much. I think if you were to look at your life and think about it for just a little bit, where is God active? What is God doing? Is God doing anything amazing? Is there any transformation that's happening in your life or in the lives around you that is absolutely amazing? Can you see the fingerprints of God in the things that are happening uh, around you in this world and in the lives of the people around you? Um, and then maybe another question you can ask yourself uh, about this whole issue of, of amazing or amazement is, do you expect in 2024 that God will do anything amazing in your life? Do you think that God's going to do anything amazing? Uh, I think we live just kind of as things happen to us, but I think we all live with a certain expectation that God's going to do something amazing, that God is acting, that God is, is doing, that God is participating in this life with us in a way that's bringing about his will and bringing about his glory. I think that we should be asking questions like, or, or believe, believing that we, that we believe that God is going to do something. We expect great things from God. He's going to do amazing things. Um, in 2024, I can assure you that some good things are going to happen in your life that will amaze you. I think there's some good things that are going to happen. In 2024, I can also guarantee you that some difficult things are going to happen that will also amaze you. And whether they are good or they are bad or difficult or heavy or wonderful things that happen, will your amazement lead you to give glory and worship to the world you live in? Or will they lead you to give glory and worship to God? Let's pray together. Holy Father, we ask that you would be with us uh, today and in the, the year that is about to approach us. Uh, Father, if it is your will that we uh, live, if it is your will that we enter into this new year, Father, we ask that you would help us to do it with uh, great conviction that you are with us, that you are, uh, that you are uh, still the God of amazement, that you are still doing amazing things in our lives. Help us, Father, to see those things, to recognize them and to give you glory and to give you honor. Father, we ask that you would bless us in this new year. We ask you, Father, that you would give us good work to do, that you would help us to bless the lives of other people, uh, to see uh, to it that we do the things that you've called us to do as your people in this world. Father, we love you. We ask you to help us to, to see and to be a part of the amazing things that you do in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. Please bless us now, Father, as we go into um, the next portion of our worship together. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.